For generations, that mountain was the inspiration of our people. Everything good came out of the mountain. The rains, the clouds, the fog. I grew up in the countryside and as a small young girl, there was a huge tree that was near our homestead. And next to our tree was a stream. My mother told me to not collect firewood from the fig tree by the stream. I said, why? And she said, because that tree is a tree of God. I didn't know what she was talking about. But I would run there and collect water for my mother. The stream actually came out of the ground, gushing up from the belly of the earth. Now sometimes there would be thousands upon thousands of frog eggs. They're beautiful. I didn't know they were frog eggs. I would just see these beads and I would put my little hands underneath and try to lift them in the belief that I could put them around my neck and decorate myself. And I would spend hours trying to lift them up. Between the fig tree and the stream, it was beautiful. I guess it was a tree of God. In the 60s, I go back to the place I had grown up and I discover now the place of God was in a church. That's where God was. So this tree no longer called for the respect, it no longer inspired awe, it no longer was protected. They had cut it. And sure enough, the stream had also disappeared. And if the stream dies, the frog eggs, the tadpoles, the frogs, and everything else that lived in those waters disappears. And we can no longer go there and fetch the water. shed blood because of our land. We will. We have a government in this country that is actually overseeing the destruction of forests and the grabbing of public land. Today, we are faced with a challenge that calls for a shift in our thinking so that humanity stops threatening its life support system. We are called to assist the earth to heal her woods and in the process, heal our own. Zamani kabla wazungu hawajakuja huko kulikuwa na miti yetu ya kienyeji. Na maji ilikuwa nyingi sana kwa maana kila mtu alikuwa na unapeleka maji. Tukaendelea hivi vile watu wanavyoongezeka kujenga, kulima, miti tukaanza kupunguza. Na nji nayo ikaendelea na ikaendelea na kukauka. Mambo yakaanza kuharibika kwa maana kuna vizazi vingine ambavyo havikuona visima vile vile vya vya zamani vile vilivyowekwa na Mungu 
around mid 1970s i was already in the university of nairobi as a lecturer i was doing research in the field and i observed a lot of deforestation and soil loss i was hearing many rural women complain about the fact that they did not have firewood they were also complaining that they did not have enough water they had put too much of their land on cash crops like coffee and tea and children were suffering from diseases associated with the malnutrition why not plant trees i asked the women let's plant trees and the women said well we would plant trees but we don't know how and that started the whole story of, yeah, okay, let's learn how to plant trees. And we called the foresters. They came and they talked to two women. They did not really see why I was trying to teach women how to plant trees. Because to plant a tree, you need a diploma. I said, well, you, I don't think you need a diploma to plant a tree. Initially, we tried to give them seeds, and then we decided against it. We said if we give them seeds, they'll become dependent on us. <laughs> we said if you plant a tree and the tree survives, the movement will compensate you. Very small amount of money. It amounts to about four US cents per tree that survives. And so they just started very, very, very small. Very, very small. And before too long, they started showing each other. And before we knew, the tree nurseries just started mushrooming. To do matiari shua, ati no to no to ogo toriga ni to ko hada mitere, ati no to hada. Ko gure atwa beriya ko hada mitere. Trees are wonderful, they grow. And as you see them grow, you want to plant too. And before we knew, we had thousands of people doing the same thing. It was now communities empowering each other to plant trees for their own needs. The more I looked into the environment and the more I looked into the problems that people were complaining about, especially women, the more I understood that what we were complaining about were the symptoms and that we needed to understand the causes of those symptoms. Why did we deforest our country? Pocots, the Kipsigis, the Eromolos, the Somaris, the Boranas, the Merus, the Kambas, the Digos, the Masais. 8th of September, 1902. I have performed a most unpleasant duty today. I made a night march to the village where the white settler had been so brutally murdered the day before yesterday. 
I gave orders that every living thing except children should be killed without mercy. Every soul was either shot or bayoneted. We burned all the huts and raised the banana plantations to the ground. Colonel Richard Meinertz Hagen, King's African Rifles, 8th of September, 1902. Well, people felt they were going to create another dominion, like New Zealand. They felt they were making a new country, and that country would be part of the empire. Then they had a tremendous sense of mission, so fashioned today, but they felt that they had a, an imperial mission that was bringing something to Kenya, the British way of life. The settlers had to uh, clear the land for settlement and to grow other crops. So they tore down natural forests, kicked out the people, and settled a European type of community to farm. Of course, the British are not dumb. When they arrived, they must have asked themselves a question. How do we dominate these people? How do we keep them down? How do we divide them up and finish them off and rule them easily? We only have a few of us with guns. There are millions of them. The formula was weaken their cultural infrastructure, infiltrate their minds, make them think they're not good enough. Their history traditions are rotten. In fact, they, they, they came and said, this is the devil worship thing. Look, abandon that, it's dirty, it smells. Come along with us. Culture is coded wisdom. Wisdom that has been accumulated for thousands of years and generations. And because we as a society did not have a written culture, it is not something that we can go back to and read about it. When our elders died, they died with that culture. And so we were left with a vacuum and we have tried to fill that vacuum with the values that missionaries have given us. But the missionaries have given us values that are based on the Bible. And as good as they are, they are not coded wisdom of our people. There was something in our people that had helped them conserve those forests. They were not looking at trees and seeing timber. They were not looking at elephants and seeing ivory. There was no such economic value of these animals. So they let them be. It was in their culture to let them be. All people have their own culture. But when you remove that culture from them, then you kill them in a way. You kill them, you kill a very large part of them. When you consider that the people here in Kenya, the masses of the Africans here in Kenya, are probably roughly about the same stage as Great Britain was 500 years ago, uh, we do not think that normal forms of democracy are suitable. In Nairobi, capital of Kenya, Europeans and Africans still walk the streets in fear of a dreaded Mau Mau. For it is that band of fanatics whose bloody deeds have cast a dark shadow across the face of Kenya. All who carry the mark of the Mau Mau must be hunted out so that peace may come to this troubled colony. British came with the utmost force of terrorism. We were moved out, and for six years, that was the way people lived. They moved us from the from the land to a village. 
It was a huge village. We had to stay there in the village all the time. Of course, to concentrate people in the village, they had to destroy the old houses and build new ones. They had to construct camps. They had to do a lot of uh, deforestation. Most of our environment were destroyed by the government so, to fight the enemies because the forest was leak and the Mau Mau were hiding in the forest. They burnt it down, they came and bombed the areas. What used to be forest as we grew up in five years became bare. Imagine in Kenya the day when Africans will govern the country and you will be governed by them. Oh yes, I think so. Later days. How would you react to that? Well, I think we are, um, we've all got to realize that one of these days we've, we've got to accept it. It only remains for me to present to you, Mr. Prime Minister, these constitutional instruments which establish Kenya's independence. In 1963, the challenge was, do we continue the colonial legacy of deforesting? Sadly, they continue with the colonial practice of exploiting the forest and not recovering forested lands. Mm -hmm. Daniel Doroitich Arab Moy, na haba kwamba nitakuwa maminifu kwa jamuri ya Kenya, na kuitumikia kwa moyo wangu... The policy of the Kenyatta and Moy government was no different in terms of forestry or natural resources from the colonial one. It was, in fact, a bit worse. These elites can continue to exploit resources and to enrich themselves at the expense of the environment and the people. It's a matter of division of the loot, who got what, all the way up. There was a regime in Kenya that was giving the impression that this country is impossible for anybody to change. From 1984 to 1988, a lot of our people left the country. A lot of our people were imprisoned. A lot of our people were killed. It was uh, brutal. It was very, very powerful. It had the country in its grip. And it had the power and the willingness to, to use that power to crush any opposition. When the women started, nobody was bothering them because nobody took them seriously. You know, who takes women seriously? Then the government realized that we were organizing women. So they started interfering with our organizing and they demanded you have to have a license, you, have, you cannot meet, you cannot do. They harassed women a lot. お、<笑><笑> The movement 
started as a tree planting campaign, but it is a little more than just the planting of trees. It's planting of ideas, it's giving them reasons why they should protect their environmental rights, and giving them reason why they should protect their women rights. In 1989, the government, led by President Moy, wanted to take Uhuru Park and build a 62-story skyscraper and a four-story statue of President Moy himself, constructed using funds that were going to be borrowed from international institutions such as the World Bank. This is a public park. It's the only place in Nairobi where you can go and lie down and nobody asks you what you are doing and nobody asks you for a fee. The movement, the Green Belt was really growing at that time. And when this information came uh, to her, she immediately came to the office and said, well, guess what? They are about to destroy the only major park in Nairobi. We cannot let it happen. And then she said, now I have an idea. I said, okay, what's the idea? I want to protest through the British government. I've written this letter, okay. We wrote and we gave the example of how the environment in third world countries is destroyed with the full knowledge and support of the developed countries who support dictators, who, who don't help us to overcome these dictators and who do business with these dictators and then hold the poor people to account. It infuriated the head of state and it infuriated the parliamentarians because they felt, why should she take this local issue outside of the confines of this sovereign state? They want to get personal. They want to debase your womanhood. So I said, now don't give me that. Just use the anatomy that matters right now. And that is from the neck up. Na mama moja na jitokeza. Na kwa testuri mama kwa ki Afrika lazima kwa jumu wa kwa jumu wa naume. Na mimi nauliza kina mama muko wapi kutudisipli moja wapu enu. I remember friends walking across the street so that we would not meet. And I remember some friends meeting me and not wanting to stand and talk because they did not want to be associated. She was disobedient at a time when disobedience was not tolerated. You raise your consciousness to a level where you feel that you must do the right thing because it is the only right thing to do. The international community withdrew and did not give President Moy the money that he needed and so the project died. It was a turning point, but most people could not understand also or imagine the courage of an individual who could stand up against this dictator. To me, in all her fights, that was the biggest fight. Because that also was the turning point in this country, that no matter how small, no matter what you are, you can make a difference. It was at that point that people felt that if one little woman of no, <laughs> no significance as far as they were concerned, except that I was so stubborn, can stop that building. Surely, 
this government can be changed. The experiences of childhood are very much what molds us and makes us who we are. The water you drink, the air you breathe, the food you eat, that's what you become. The world of my childhood was a world that was full of life, where children were given stories. And these stories were living stories. My aunt especially was very good at telling stories and I loved to go and visit her because she would tell me stories till I would fall asleep. <laughs> and her stories were about dragons, about animals, a world where animals would talk to you. It was almost a lesson. Be careful with life. Be careful with tricksters who will put you into trouble. Don't be greedy. Don't be selfish. You, you get all this teaching through these stories. about the religious, people who are doing things for the common good, who are pursuing truth. I felt like I was valued. I felt like I was protected. I grew to believe that everybody's rights should be respected. Everybody should be listened to. I guess I was copying my nuns. I wanted to do good. My five and a half years in America transformed me. What to be a good citizen was, what to be respected was. It was not easy to come back and try to reflect that in my society. My society had hardly changed, but I had been completely changed. When I went back home, I was constantly being reminded I'm an African woman, and so there are certain things I shouldn't do, certain ambitions that I should not entertain. And that was a problem for me because I had never thought of myself as, a, as an African woman. I never thought of myself as a woman to begin with. For me, the limit was my capacity, my capability. was considered to be the sage of the family. Women were not sages. So if the male is the sage, then he is the source of wisdom. Women followed. But I suspect that Wangari didn't always follow, <laughs> that she probably decided, the way no matter, now I have my own view on this matter. <laughs> In a period of a couple of years, she had the divorce. She was denied the opportunity to go into parliament, and she lost her professorial position at the University of Nairobi. I've gone through a divorce that was very bad, and I have paid my lawyers through my nose, and I am broke to the bone. We were at a swimming pool, and the children wanted chips and sausages. And I said, I don't have any money. To be without money, and your child wants chips and sausages, and you can't buy. And he doesn't understand how you cannot have money, so he starts crying.
life is a struggle. You walk along it and you hope that things will be absolutely wonderful. And sometimes they aren't. And you wonder what happened. So, picking myself by my strings is my way of um, making sure that <clears throat> no matter how desperate a situation seems, that I don't completely give up. In many ways, this influenced the way I walked ever after. Would I really have stood up as long as I did if he was there? I do not know, but I'm quite sure the path would have been very different. We see corruption, we see fraud, we see government mistreating its citizens to the fullest. During the darkest period when nobody would talk, too afraid, when the government was a terror government, it is a credit to those few people that they kept the light burning in the dark. We are dealing here with a government that is violating the law. I, uh, I think that the government has an, uh, a case to answer. What we are experiencing is harassment. It's sheer harassment. Why are you arresting him? I was in prison for six years and the charges were sabotage, belonging to uh, another ground organization, and uh, p uh, publishing seditious publications. Who is going to question when the government, when the police, when the law keepers break the law? The crowd of women gathered out on Uhuru Park to pressure for the release of their sons, friends and relatives who have been imprisoned for political reasons. They walked with resolve to make their demands known we have come to give you this letter uh, to request you as the official advisor to the government to, to please advise our government that the time has come for the politi all political prisoners to be released. And that's what we did. We brought our blankets and our mattresses, a few mothers and some supporters, and we said we shall wait there until the sons are released. We stayed that night. We did not eat, we only drank, and no sons came. The second day, we waited, again the whole day, and no sons came. The third day, no sons came. By the third day, a lot of people had begun to come who were themselves victims of torture. And for the very first time in this country, people narrated the torture they had gone through. And men would cry tears as they narrated that story. the government decided enough was enough. When the government descended on us, 
in that moment of desperation, women stripped, stuck naked, and shook their breasts. In the African tradition, if men beat women, it is like sons violating their mothers. And the mothers respond by cursing them. And they curse them by showing them their nakedness. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> Tutai ida wagari ya hore tu amu nato doni ni ni da hano kivya doa shoto roni ni da rutire gugiti gojaga agono iwa ku mutumia ati iwa jaga ni ni mo ni ni da rutire gugiti gojaga ni ni da ruira na polisi ku mona tu wagari kwa jadi aku a hore no abete ku horo mo do wagari wanda iwa wagari ali tu do wagari utu hau masho kile magi tu arona tu bi agi magi tu arona Nairobi hospital. We were holding a service, the Ash Wednesday service here. And as we, we were going on with the service, we saw these women. They said, look, we have nowhere to go. So I very, very quickly made a decision and I took them into the bunker, which is down below here. Tu ini kerak tu itu ada tu bishoko tu yang terlalu agak ni nak kau angkat lagi masih betul ya, nak so kira kira kau lah. People who are working, they would come there and actually see the pride of these women, and that also had to be stopped by the government. But you would get 500 people, a thousand people assembling there, and they are talking about democratic principles, about governance. What the government of that particular time did not want is anybody who is trying to educate the common people. Little did I know that they were to stay there for how many? Almost 11 months. I was able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot there was a, a ceremony at the cathedral to welcome us back to freedom. She gave each one of us a huge hug to welcome us back to freedom. And, you know, it, of course it was very, very touching. And they went home with their sons. One year later. <laughs> From the day she started the Green Belt Movement in 1977, the government saw her and saw a future leader. And hence, the government put a program how to fight this person. It got her into trouble, not just because she was protesting, but also because she was demonstrating the p potential power of a civil society. thing that I deliberately did was try not to break the law. I knew that if I break the law, I'll give the system a great excuse to get me out of the way. We were constantly on the lookout to make sure they didn't pick her up, particularly secretly, where nobody could protest, because that's when the damage can be done. We did not want her tortured.
It was during this time that our country was suffering from tribal conflict. When a person from one tribe becomes the president, he almost gets the key to the national resources. And his tribesmen believe they can remove members of another tribe from lands. Members of other tribes believe they will be marginalized. It became very easy for politicians to mobilize their tribe against the enemy tribe to hit back at a community that is not supporting their man, who is the president. As long as the resources are not being managed properly, as long as the resources are not being shared more equitably, we will be threatened. We always had seminars, but our seminars were mostly to teach people how to plant trees. But during that crisis, we wanted people to understand how we govern ourselves. This concern gave rise to a completely different program, which we call Civic and Environmental Education. Nitulina Oroa Mwada Nire. Initially, most of the problems were blamed on the authorities. And it was very important to convince them that many of the problems they have listed actually come from themselves. What on it okay? To Hamwe. I don't have a reportant. And I would use a metaphor of traveling. If you take the wrong steps, if you take the wrong bus, you will end up in the wrong place and you are likely to encounter a lot of problems. Okay, Okay, Nego <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, we would come to the conclusion we need to stop the bus. And let's go out of the bus and stop the ignorance. Let us educate each other. Let's send our children to school. And the people would eventually say, now we are ready to confront the driver. <laughs> You cannot enslave a mind that knows itself, that values itself, that understands itself. Uh, after a long bastard room, I have tried a lot to go and talk to women here and there. 
to, to, to have groups. <laughs> we try to encourage ourselves because if we don't do that, our country will come to expand. Now I have courage to say anything. First we pray, then we have hope of what thought we are doing, then we do. The little, little grassroots people, they can change this world. Somebody came to me and told me that the government had dished out large tracts of Karura forest, which was public land, and had decided to give it to his political friends and colonies and supporters. <laughs> So as usual, we decided that we would go on a tree planting mission to reclaim Karura forest. We came to plant trees and of course, as we can all see, some armed guards whom we knew were stationed here to prevent us from entering the forest. It's a very sad saga that we have a government in this country that is actually overseeing the destruction of forests and the grabbing of public land. We've been given instructions, no one should enter here, despite anything, we are ready for anything. They told her, if you dare do it, we are going to kill you. And she said, I can't leave this place today before I plant a tree. We want honesty, we want justice. If you're going to shed blood because of our land, we will. We are used to that. Our forefathers shed blood for our land. We will do so. This is my blood. And I, it, it reminds me of the blood that Waiyaki shed, trying to protect Karura Forest. <laughs> government. It became a national issue. Ordinary people, university students, everybody wanted to save the forest. The whole town was on fire. And I think that's one of the things that made Moy decide enough is enough. <laughs> Mimi, Pangare Muta Madai, Naapa Kwaba, Itaitumikia Kwa Waminifu, Jamuri ya Kenya, Naraisiwake, Weshimwa Mwai Kibatu. 
The other day we were with the military and I'm really trying to encourage the military to establish forests around their barracks. She kind of encouraged them through that launching day that in fact they should be holding the gun in the left hand and a tree in the right hand. We believe that soldiers and trees are brothers uh, because our role is to protect the country uh, and the role of the trees is to protect the environment. So God willing, by the end of this year, we should be able to plant about one million trees. It is the people who must save the environment. It is the people who must make their leaders change. So we must stand up for what we believe in. And we cannot be intimidated. In the course of history, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness, to reach a higher moral ground. A time when we have to shed our fear and give hope to each other. That time is now. The challenge as I stand here today is to restore this home for the tadpoles and give back to the children a world of beauty and wonder. Thank you very much. <laughs>